A gorgeous day in the Bay Area for baseball as we welcome you to Oakland. The big league schedule gets off to an early start this Wednesday as we bring you the series finale between the Cincinnati Reds and the Oakland A's. Afternoon baseball in Oakland alongside Sean Casey, Matt Vaskersian. MLB Network is proud to present an MLB.com production of the A's and the Reds. A truly spectacular day, partially obscured by Mount Davis. We'll get into that as we continue here, Sean. It's the last of this three-game series. The Cincinnati Reds looking for a sweep. Today, the A's have Vin Mazzaro, the second-year right-hander out of New Jersey, trying to stop a slight skid. Last work on Friday at St. Louis allowed four earned runs over five innings to work and took a 6-4 loss to the Cardinals. Johnny Cueto takes the ball for the Cincinnati Reds. He's been terrific this year. He has been terrific. He's been one of their go-to stars. Big reason why they've been around, hover around the first place in the Central all year talking about the standings for each club in fact the Oakland A's have fallen on hard times in the month of June it wasn't long ago a month ago they were perched atop the West for the Cincinnati Reds they're standing in a little better shape in the National League Central just a game back of the Cardinals pace atop the pack and speaking of the Reds Sean they've been doing it with some pretty big offense this is the National League's top ranked offense in a number of categories it really is I mean they have got it done offensively Brandon Phillips is having another great year Jay Bruce has swung the bat well but Joey Votto this guy has been the key all season long really becoming one of the best hitters in baseball He's driving in runs, hitting a lot of home runs. But this is the big surprise, Johnny Gomes right here. He was expected to be a platoon player with Lance Nix all season long. And Johnny Gomes has stepped up. He leads the team in RBIs with 49. He's hitting 434 with runners in scoring position with two outs. Been pretty impressive. Johnny Gomes has probably been the big surprise for the Reds this season. Reds have been a big offensive club. That has not been the story for the Oakland A's. They have had to scrap and really scratch for run productivity. Rajay Davis hit leadoff a lot in the absence of Coco Crisp. Crisp is back and in the lineup today. But in his absence, Davis running wild to top that lineup card. One of the game's stolen base leaders. Well, Rajay Davis brings a dynamic of speed. You know, speed has been... It is big for a club. Coco Chris brings that too. But Kevin Kuzminoff's been a big bat lately. Really has really caught fire this month. Hit a big home run the other day, uh, sending in extra innings. Coco Chris, as you see here, he's back homeward last night. So getting him back in the lineup is going to help add some offense and, uh, and complement Rajay Davis's speed. So we'll see what they can do today. Oakland A's and Cincinnati Reds in the series finale. Of course, there's plenty of folklore in this matchup, but uh, the kind of folklore that Kurt Suzuki wasn't around to watch. 1990, of course, the Oakland A's were swept by the Reds in the World Series. The Reds getting a little payback from a seven-game World Series loss back in 1972. We'll revisit some of that folklore and talk about the current game, the lineups, and opening pitch from Oakland are coming up next.
We welcome you back to Oakland, formerly called the Oakland Alameda County Coliseum, home of champions. Hasn't been a championship in this building in either football or baseball in quite some time. And, of course, the Oakland Coliseum, one of only two multi-sport ballparks still left in the big leagues. The other one in Florida, and that one's going away soon. Let's get you right to the red starting lineup per Dusty Baker's lineup card this morning. A former A, Orlando Cabrera, leads it off at shortstop. Miguel Cairo will spell Scott Rowland at third base and bat second. Joey Votto, a likely all-star at first base, batting third. Brandon Phillips and Johnny Gomes in the four and five slot. Gomes occupying that DH position for the National League Red Legs today. Jay Bruce, Lance Nix, Drew Stubbs. And another former A, Ramon Hernandez, round things out for Cincinnati. These Reds taking swings against the 23-year-old second-year right-hander, Vin Mazzaro, who again is coming off a loss at St. Louis on Friday. Mazzaro drafted as a third-rounder back in 2005 and made his big league debut four years later at their ripe old age of 22. He's looking for his third win of the year this afternoon. Uh, pretty impressive he got there so quick. Uh, uh, from Hackensack, New Jersey, and they, they expect some big things from him. They, they have a lot of good young pitching in this rotation, and they like Vin Mazzaro to, to be one of those guys of the future in that staff. And Mazzaro in the rotation spot now that was uh, occupied by Brett Anderson, who was unfortunately lost to the DL again. But as Sean mentions, the A's uh, pride themselves on having a lot of young pitching depth, something that they hope to build on as they move forward. Gorgeous afternoon for baseball once again. As we are ready for first pitch, Orlando Cabrera set to start things out. Exchanging pleasantries with a former teammate. One of those shirt sleeve afternoons in the Bay Area. 63 degrees and sunny at game time. Red starting play today, 39 and 33. Again, a game back of the Cardinals in the National League Central. Cardinals in action along with the rest of the league later tonight. First pitch of the ball game. Misses the corner. A ball and no First strikes to Orlando Cabrera. Cabrera, Cairo, and Votto for the Reds. And there's a strike to make it one and one. You know, talking to Mark Berry, the third base coach for the Cincinnati Reds, I said, hey, what is it? What's different about you guys this year? What is it about, uh, about the chemistry of that club? He, he just... He had nothing but great things to say about Scotty Rowland and this guy Orlando Cabrera saying they brought a lot of, they both won championships, they brought a lot to this club. Orlando Cabrera rings, really brings that vocal leader that they've been looking for and uh, that's why they went out and got him. Chasing a breaking ball off the corner in the first act of business for Vin Mazzaro is a strikeout, one gone to start the ball game. Batting second. Pitch right here looks like a little cut fastball. Got him outside. Sometimes this is a pitch where you get two strikes and the, the ball's on the outside half and you just you just bite for it. A nice pitch right there to start the game off. So one gone now for the veteran Miguel Cairo. And Cairo's first ball pick and he taps it on the ground over to Mark Ellis, who's been as right as rain defensively. We take a look at the rest of that defense for the Oakland A's. They rank around the middle of the pack in the American League, catching it at a 984 clip. Mark Ellis is really the guy that makes it go. Third best career fielding percentage of any second baseman with 750 more games under his belt. Kevin Kuzminoff last year committed three errors in 311 chances in San Diego, setting a National League record. Two gone now for Joey Votto. Votto's had a nice series. Three for ten with a home run that came on Monday in the Reds' extra innings win. And Sean likely headed to the All-Star game this year. Yeah, and that home run he hit the other day, that's why he's so good. It went to left center, absolute rocket, and that's what he does so well. He takes, he does a lot of his damage in the in left center, right center gap. And that's why he hits for a high average, because he uses that left field so well. Man, this guy's an all-star, becoming one of the better hitters in the game, and he, he's really their main run producer. Two gone bases empty for him here in the top of the first. Votto's hit safely in nine of his last ten. And the 2 1 from Mazzaro. There's another breaking ball. That one down low. Three balls and a strike. Now, when I was still over there, you know, obviously my last year in 05, holding down the, the four to first base there for the Cincinnati Reds, Joey Votto was, would come up and play. Uh, uh, at spring training games with us up in the up uh, you know to join us for a little bit. What a great kid, and, and uh, it's just really neat to see him 
uh, become the player he's become over these over these last couple of years. Canadian guy. Yeah, yeah Canadian guy. Soft spoken, real nice kid. Four. Brandon. All the Canadians are soft-spoken and nice, it seems like. say anything unkind about the Canadian guys. Matt Stairs, Chris Reesma, Jason Bay, Joey Votto. So Votto's aboard with two gone. And now it's Brandon Phillips, who had a three-for-five game two of the series last night. Phillips starting play just over 300 with nine home runs and 24 runs driven in, having a fine season. And leading the NL in runs scored. This guy is getting on base, scoring a lot of runs. Sometimes he gets overlooked, too. He's one of the better, better second baseman baseball player. A gold glove winner back in 2008. Votto will pick his spots and run, by the way, as Phillips hits the hole on the right side. That shot past Mark Ellis. Votto trying to wrap and now stopping at second base. So runners at first and second here to start the day with two gone against Mazzaro. Nice piece of hit and kind of got inside that ball, shot the right field. Good, good base run, though, by Joey Votto. Maybe had a chance to stretch out to get the first and third, but with two outs, you really don't want to do that. But you see Brandon Phillips here, gets inside the ball, shoots it to right. Obviously, Votto, you got to know your outfielders, right? He knows Gross has a cannon, and he realizes, all right, we, we don't want, I don't want to be the third out, the third base, and we'll stop there in second, keep this inning going. Yeah, Joey Votto, even, uh, even a Canadian knows that, uh, you know, when you're playing against a guy who played college quarterback in yeah. the SEC, right? Right. As Gabe Gross did at Auburn, you're not going to take many chances early in the ballgame on a guy like that. Yeah. Well, he can throw the pill now. And he also and he also knows that Johnny Gomes is uh, is up there in the league leaders of the running and scoring position with two outs, knowing he's coming to the plate and, ha and has 49 ribbons. So he's going to give Johnny a chance here to drive him in. Gomes is the Reds' RBI leader. Though stuck in a one for 15 slide here on this Reds road trip. Oh, that comes in and gets him. So the Reds with two gone on a walk, a base hit, and now a hit batsman have loaded the bases in the top of the first. It never feels good to start your day off. You got a day game out there, battling to wake up. First, the bat you wear one right in the hand. Ooh, list. But so a little early jam for Vin Mazzaro to try to crawl out of. He'll have to face a left-handed hitter. This is a tough part of the lineup here for the Reds, given it's Bruce and then Lance Nix, back-to-back left-handed batters. Bases are loaded. And Jay Bruce has been swinging the bat well lately. He's got off to a slow start, but in his last three games, he's hitting uh, 455. Big spot for him right here, maybe looking to jump on that first pitch fastball. Bruce has had a nice series, four for seven here in Oakland, and he takes a first pitch strike. Nine home runs, 31 runs batted in for young Jay Bruce. Still finding that consistency at the big league level after his rookie campaign last season, beyond now 0-2. I think a big key for Jay is to keep using that left center gap. You see Mazzaro here busted him away, his first two fastballs out of the outside corner. So, uh, we're gonna try and stay away from Bruce. Suzuki sets up off the plate and Bruce fouls it away. When you watch Jay Bruce swing the bat, Sean, and uh, we had him in Studio 42 at MLB Network in the offseason, really a pure left-handed stroke. It's hard not to imagine this guy's going to turn into a 300 hitter every year at some point. Yeah, I, I, he has the ability to be that 300 hitter with 30-some with 30, 30 home runs and driving 100 RBIs. But there it is. That's what he does so well right there. Gets that fastball inside, drives it to right. Jay Bruce cashing in with the bases loaded, a two-run single, and the Reds jump off to an early lead. You saw Mazzaro there go sinker away, sinker away, sinker away. And I really believed, you know, he wasn't trying, that, that is not where he wanted that pitch to go. But Jay Bruce waits on him, they try to get inside, doesn't get it inside enough. It's too good of a pitch, 0-2, and Jay Bruce is too good of a hitter. And if you're going to make that mistake on him, bases loaded, he's going to make you pay. Nice piece of hitting right there by, by Jay. Boy, it started out to, with a couple of easy outs, and Kurt Young's going to come out and perhaps talk about that very same thing, Sean, the uh, A's pitching coach who spent a good deal of his playing career in the A's uniform. Yeah, well, right, right here, you know, he's, you know, he's got to come out and tell Mazzaro, hey, listen, settle down. Let, let's go back to getting that strike one. And maybe, you know, when you get 0-2, you want to bury a pitch there or get a pitch up. 
That was too good of a pitch to Bruce right there. But, uh, yeah, he got a two quick outs and then just got into a little bit of trouble right here. So now Lance Nix. Nix making his first start of the series. A two-out walk, then the single by Phillips. Gomes was hit with a pitch, and Jay Bruce singles in a pair. 2 nothing Cincinnati already this afternoon. For Jay Bruce, that was just his second hit this season with the bases loaded. He had been one for six previously. Taking advantage of that early opportunity. We're going to talk a little bit about this as we continue, Sean. The Reds have historically, and you know this firsthand, not enjoyed the trips west. And it's really been true the last couple of years, but they've got an opportunity here to finish off a sweep in Oakland. Well, it is true. For some reason, that's a good point. Every time the Reds, and even when I was there, we go out west, you know, we just kind of scuffle through those road trips. But they got beat up a little bit by Seattle in the last series, scored one run in those three games. But they've come in and taken to Oakland these first couple of games. They're trying to get the sweep here today. Here's the 3 0 home and a strike. Zero benefiting from the Brian Onora high corner of the strike zone there on three and oh. Three balls and a strike now to Lance Nix. And a full count. Nice hack. Nice hack right there. When you get three one right there, you're trying to keyhole him, get a pitch middle in, he got it, just fouled it back. Full count with runners at first and second and two gone. Johnny Cueto is going to take the mound here this afternoon on the road with a lead in the bottom of the first. And Ben Mazzara hoping to get us there right now. Here's the payoff home. Bounce to the right side for Derek Barton to retire the side. The Reds make it a productive start to the day, however, with two in the first. After a half inning, the Reds are on top, 2-0. Welcome back. We take a look at the Oakland A's starting lineup against Johnny Cueto this afternoon. Coco Crisp is back, making his second start since being reactivated off the DL, leading off in center field. Barton and Connor Jackson in the two and three spots. Kurt Suzuki, one of just a handful of catchers in the big leagues batting cleanup these days. Kevin Kuzminoff lost a 16-game hitting streak with an 0 for 3 yesterday. Gabe Gross, Adam Rosales, Mark Ellis, and Rajay Davis round out the A's. And again, on the mound for Cincinnati, making his 15th start of the year, an all-star candidate in 2010, 24-year-old third-year right-hander Johnny Cueto. Big sinker, nice, uh, real nice slider, and a great changeup. He's got top-of-the-rotation type stuff. 
fastball in the mid, you know, low to mid 90s. But this is a guy when he's on, he could shut you out all day long. Here's his 1 1 pitch home to Coco Crisp, and it's a two ball and one strike count now. Well, Johnny Cueto, the last time around, as, uh, as you alluded to earlier, Sean, was on the bad end of a real tough luck loss. Shut out in Seattle, 1 0, and was opposing Cliff Lee on a night he decided to throw a complete game shutout. Hang with him. Yeah, and, you know, they asked Cueto after the game what he thought. He said, hey, listen, Cliff Lee's one of the best. Pitchers in the game. He's a guy I want to just be like, and uh, he outdueled me tonight. But it's tough to get outdueled one nothing. Coco Crisp taking a look at a called strike three. I tell you what, that's one of those pitches right there as a hitter. That's it's unhittable. That's outside. The Reds' defense, a very good version of uh, of it this year, Sean. A nationally low 28 errors this season. They lead the circuit in fielding percentage. Cabrera is a two time gold glover at short. Brandon Phillips won one in 2008. And you're talking about a, a, a gold glover, uh, many time gold glover, Scott Rowland over there at third base that's not in there today, but he's, he's also a big reason why their, their uh, defense has been much improved. Derek Barton now with one gone here in the bottom half of the first. Barton is hitting a modest three straight at the start of play today. The Oakland A's don't boast the kind of gaudy offensive totals that the Reds do. Make no mistake. As we mentioned earlier, they've had to scrap for productivity much of the year as that one hopper is handled by Votto for out number two. A reminder, we'll be bringing you bonus coverage today of Steven Strasburg's fourth big league start. He faces the Royals in D.C. That one starts at 4.30 Eastern, 1.30 Pacific. We'll continue bringing you the A's and Reds in select markets, but many of you will be sent out to Washington, D.C. to watch Steven Strasburg on the mound tonight. He has certainly captured the imaginations of uh, fans and non-fans alike as Connor Jackson steps in. Yeah, you want to talk about great stuff. I mean, Steven Strasburg, I can't remember the last time this kind of fanfare uh, Major League Baseball has had for a player. And, and talk about living up the expectations that were exceeding expectations of what everyone thought he was going to be with four unbelievable pitches in the 100-mile-an-hour range with a with a great 11-to-5 slider that just, I mean, it's the curveball that's so late in the zone. He, Fun to watch. Jackson pops it into the spacious foul ground in Oakland, and an easy play for Miguel Cairo. Thank you, Al Davis. An 11 pitch inning. Be afraid to put some seats there.
Two nothing Reds as we start the top of the second. And Sean, you can get a look there at what we talked about getting out of that previous half inning. All the space at the Oakland Alameda County Coliseum. Again, a multi-purpose facility. And ever since it opened in 1966, it has been configured this way to accommodate both baseball and football. Yeah. The result is it's been a pitcher's paradise for much of its existence. Yeah, and a, and a, and a hitter does not like popping the ball up there in, uh, in Oakland because you're out. I mean, look at all that. And, and I tell you what, as a corner infielder, too, playing first base there, you almost become an outfielder. You know, you're running the ball, you're, and you just keep running, and you're like, all right, there's still grass under me, and I'm still running. Am I, am I playing right field or first base? I always felt that way when I was playing out in Oakland. Just had to keep running, and whenever the ball went up, you had to just go for it and, and not know, not think it was going to be out of play because it usually wasn't. Drew Stubbs swinging and sending one foul. The ball in two strikes. Stubbs leading things off here in the top of the second. Stubbs, Hernandez, and Cabrera for the Reds. If you're just joining us, the Reds stacked together a couple of runs in the first on a two-run single by Jay Bruce that came with the bases loaded and two gone. And sounded like a broken bat roller for ex-Red Adam Rosales. And there's one gone. That's a nice play right there by Rosales because obviously Drew Stubbs can flat out fly. Rosales knew he needed to get around that ball and get rid of it. Nice play right there. The catcher, number 55, Ramon Hernandez. See right here, Stubbs gets out the box. Rosales knows it. And obviously, Rosales is a former Red, played here, knows knows Drew Stubbs' speed. But that makes him that he turns a tough play into a in, into a pretty easy looking play. Nice job right there. One gone for a former Oakland A, from a former Red to a former A. Ramon Hernandez was an All Star in Oakland in 2003, and the slider taken for a strike. Hernandez having a resurgent season, batting 293. The power numbers may have gone away from where they were, say, five, six years ago when he was in his prime in Oakland and then in San Diego. But still the veteran presence in the clubhouse and, uh, again, hitting at a near 300 clip. Also hit a big home run the other day to put them up in extra innings. Just hit the foul pole down the left field line, got an inside fastball, got, kept his hands in, kept it fair. And that one's grounded to Rosales. Two gone. Used to call Adam Pete Rosales when he was a Cincinnati Red, not only because of the clever play on words, but because he was one of those no, guys that was Charlie Hustle. Two. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> sliding, diving, <laughs> crashing into walls. I mean, he runs faster on a home run than anybody in the big leagues. I mean, I'd love to get a time, get a clock on him when he when he hits one out. He sprints around the bases as fast as I've seen anybody ever do it. Here's Orlando Cabrera now. And Mazzara starts him with a slider for a strike. Cabrera hitless 0 for 5 yesterday. Did not get the start in game one of the series on Monday. I know, yeah, du I, nothing know, in two. I know Dustin Baker's working on getting Paul Yonish some starts too, trying to get Cabrera a break here and there. You know, not a spring chicken anymore because obviously still get it done out there, but. Paul Giannis is, is a serviceable guy to put out there short too. Ben Mazzaro with an all business comeback inning in the second as Orlando Cabrera's caught looking. They go down in order, do the Reds, an inning and a half gone, 2 0 Cincinnati.
middle of the order for the A's as they trail Cincinnati 2 0 in the bottom half of the second. Back alongside Sean Casey, Matt Vaskersian. Nice to have you with us on MLB Network this afternoon. Gorgeous day for baseball in the Bay Area. Kurt Suzuki leads things off for Oakland. An all star candidate in 2010. Suzuki two for nine in the series. It'll be Suzuki, Kuzmanoff, and Gross against Johnny Cueto. You know, we mentioned that, Sean, that Kurt Suzuki's an all-star candidate. We've already talked about guys like Joey Votto, Johnny Cueto being all-star worthy this year. Both the A's and Reds have been in a, a downturn, if you will, to where they've had only one player representing their team for the last five straight years. I mean, you go back the years prior, obviously, when, when these these two clubs were, were consistently good. A lot of representation in the All-Star game as Suzuki is retired. Well, that could change this year for the Reds. I mean, you have, obviously, Joey Votto has a good shot at going. Scotty Rowland's having a great year. He's got a good shot at going. Uh, you could also make the argument about Brandon Phillips having a good shot to go. And what about Arthur Rhodes? .29 ERA. He's got a shot to go too. Arthur Rhodes has been unbelievable out of that Reds bullpen this year. And, and in his 20th big league season, he might be a first time All Star this year. That would be awesome. Yeah. Remind you of what Tim Wakefield did last year. Here's Kevin Kuzminov now. And a high drive into right. Jay Bruce has room, but that guy had a better angle. It's <laughs> not a bad play right there. Way to go, Cha Cha. <laughs> Looks like uh, can be our talk show host Gary Radnish out there in the corner. <laughs> That's a nice play right there. Look at the dude to his right. You know Radnich? Yeah, right. <laughs> and he's ducking out of the way like Radnich would too. <laughs> Guzmanov puts this one into play at third for Cairo, and there were two gone. So the last time that the Reds had multiple All Star representation, 2004. Right, right, Griffey, Graves, Larkin, Casey. How about that, huh? You were a part of that last I class. I, yeah, I was a part of that last class. We had, uh, we were leading the leading the uh, central at the break. We had some, we had some guys with some great years that year. Danny Graves was doing great in saves. Lark and Griffin, myself. So, um, it'd be nice to see the Reds, you know, and even Oakland too, get get a, get a few more guys back to the All Star game instead of just having one representative. Gabe when, Gross now, he takes a strike. When you have more than one, that means you're playing well. You know, that means you're a good ball club. Usually when you have to find one, you're not doing that good. It's got to be more fun to go with friends. Too, oh, right? it's so much more fun. Nothing worse than walking into an all-star clubhouse and be like, hey, man, how you doing? Hey, man. You want to walk in there with, you know, Barry Larkin's your buddy. Be like, hey, Larkin, let's eat some lunch before we head over to the park today or let's hang out. You know, it's a lot better when if you're walking in by yourself, you don't know anybody. Oh, and two, the count from Johnny Cuento to Gabe Gross. A reminder, we'll send many of you to Steven Strasburg's start at home against the Royals coming up in just a bit. Those viewers in other markets, including you in Cincinnati and in the San Francisco Bay Area, will stay with us for the Reds and A's. Part of a busy day here on MLB Network. They used to call him Mini Pedro, Johnny Cueto, when he came up as a young Red. Dominican-born right-hander goes home on one-two and strikes out Gabe Gross. Two punch-outs among the six straight retired by Cueto to start his afternoon. Still two-nothing Reds.
The interleague portion of the schedule continues this weekend, and on Friday, we'll bring you interleague action between the Tigers and the Braves from Turner Field in Atlanta. Tigers, Braves, some of you will see the Twins and Mets interleague play, interleague matchups on Friday right here on MLB Network, fueled by Subway. Vin Mazzaro back to work, still down 2 nothing. And it'll be Miguel Cairo leading things off in the visitors third Cairo Votto and Phillips. There's some pretty good matchups coming up this weekend case in the interleague schedules. These two clubs that we're watching here the Reds and A's. Will be changing opponents of course and for the Reds it's back home. The Buckeye State battle they've got the Indians That's coming right. to town. It's always a good one. And you're one you're one of only a handful of guys of recent vintage to have played for both of those clubs so you have a better perspective on that than most yeah there's definitely an appreciation in Ohio when you're playing when you're playing for Cincinnati you're playing for Cleveland the fans love to have that Ohio in-state rivalry and it, I know earlier at the end of the 90s uh, in the 2000 2001 really when the Yankees had, when the Indians had those big clubs you know, we'd, those games would sell out at both places. A roll over ground ball. Adam Rosales has been busy this afternoon. He puts a lot of hair on it over to first, doesn't he? He does. He's got a good arm. He's one of those guys you pay, you know, when you're coming with your son, you pay money to see Adam Rosales play just because of the way he plays the game. But listen, he plays hard, but he's a, this is a good ball player right here. I mean, he can play all over the place, too. He can play the infield, outfield, but he does have a good arm. Acquired from the Reds in a in a deal that we talked about on MLB Network that was really strange as Joey Votto digs in now with one gone. It was Rosales going from Cincinnati to Oakland in exchange for Willie Tavares and Aaron Miles. Tavares was released, I think, the next day. Right away, yeah. And you know the guy that plays now from from those from that group. Is Rosales and Miles and Tavares were the two veterans who were certainly a little more familiar names to the uh, lay fan. Yeah, and you would think to yourself with the energy he brings to the park every day, why wouldn't you want to keep him around? And he's, you know, he's very valuable as far as being able to play a, a number of positions and play him well. Splitting time at shortstop with the A's along with Cliff Pennington. Votto sends a drive into the opposite field. Rajay Davis with the glasses on. Now he yields to oh. Coco Crisp, who clanks it. Wow, looks like, yeah, that, hey, that sun some, sometimes is open. It, it, it can be tough. It looks like they just converged, and, and Coco at the last second just kind of took his eye off the ball right well, here. Well, one of those guys doesn't have the glasses on. Uh. And it's the guy wearing his glasses on the back of his hat. How about him? Number four. Yep. You see him Brandon. look away at the second. It looks at Rajay Davis right before he catches the ball and just doesn't squeeze it. Santa Maria. High <laughs> sky, as Vin Scully might say, Sean. E8. You know, I'm playing with Coco Chris. That guy, he can flat out go get it. Second game back. He just, uh, you know, he's no no one's more upset than him right now of, of planking that ball. No, no doubt, no doubt. As uh, as Brandon Phillips digs in, but I ask you this: Why are the glasses on the back of the hat? I mean, is that style points? He should not have them on the back of his hat. <laughs> he should probably have those things on. But he still doesn't feel like he needs them. So obviously the sun the sun wasn't the, wasn't the uh, factor right there. He just took his eye off the ball at the last second. Well, an RBI opportunity now for Brandon Phillips, who singled and scored back in the first. Votto aboard on the error, and Mazzaro's next offering is fouled off, foul tipped. Johnny Gomes waits next for Cincinnati. Reds on top 2-0. As we take a look at this again, Sean, there's a moment where you can see Chris looking up to try to make that catch. And based on having to follow the ball, you could see the sun being shielded by his cap, and then you saw it in his eyes. Yeah. And you can also see him, too, at the last second there, Rajay Davis is coming over. And right when, right, and, and obviously you're saying that Coco was trying to get him out of there with, I got it, I got it, I got it. So Rajay bails off, and then you see Coco at the last second kind of glance and see where Rajay is, and that's when he didn't, didn't uh, secure the ball. 
Good block by Kurt Suzuki. Let's take a look at it again. We'll slow it down here. Yeah, he just missed it. Yeah. Like I said, there ain't, there's nobody more upset right now than Coco Chris about missing that ball, especially if this run scores. Finn Mazzaro might be more upset. Finn Mazzaro is. <laughs> Two balls and two strikes to Brandon Phillips. You know, I've always wondered about guys like Brandon Phillips, Sean, and your take on it. You, your upper body was a lot more still as a hitter. Brandon Phillips almost reminds you a little bit about of, of Gary Sheffield. Sheffield yeah, right. Kind of, but if you watch, if you watch Chef, you watch Brandon Phillips, Ricky Weeks, those guys that have some movement up top. You watch right before that ball's about to come, they stop. So he'll get it going here. He kind of gets it going. It's it's more of his release. And then right here, he loads. See that stop right there? That pause to get ready to load up. Fine play by Kevin Kuzminov. And a good work a good work on the receiving end by Derek Barton as well. Not a routine chance, and they get the out at first. So Votto has to hold on at second base, and they're two gone. Yeah, definitely not a routine 31. chance. You know, when Kuzminov went to San Diego, yeah, they always know. questioned, is he going to be well good enough defensively? He's worked really hard to be good defensively. He's become one of the better third basemen in the game. But nice play right here, right, Kevin? Gets around it, gets his feet going in the right direction, gets it over to Barton. Well, there are many people who felt like Kevin Kuzminov should have won a gold glove last year in the National League in San Diego. After all, committing three errors in 311 chances, he sets a National League record for fielding percentage, yet he doesn't win the gold glove. Yeah, it, it, it is a shame. You know, I, I think, too, sometimes they start, they, they, they factor in, uh, not just your defensive stats, but your offensive stats when it comes to the gold glove. And I, you wonder sometimes, is it, you know, it should it be called the gold glove when that happens? I mean, he obviously had the best stats, was one of the best third basemen in the game, and, and was, uh, definitely should have got some recognition over there for that gold glove. Johnny Gomes, the batter now, trying to knock in Votto from second base with two gone. Gomes was hit by a pitch back in the first. takes a strike. You know, the one thing Mark Berry I haven't talked to him was telling me also about Johnny Gomes. I asked him, you know, what is it about Johnny Gomes? He's like, listen, this guy is the ultimate team guy. He comes to play every day. He shows up. He plays hard. He hustles. And he said the fans in Cincinnati have really taken to this guy because of the way he shows up to play every day. Little broken bat. This one wide of the bag at third. Kevin Kuzminov giving us a chance to talk about him again there. And Ryan Zimmerman ended up winning the gold glove last year at third base in the National League. And nobody's going to question how good he is defensively as overall. He's an incredible talent. But Ryan Zimmerman committed 17 errors last year at that same position in around the same number of chances. Yeah, well that's that, that's where that's where I think the offensive numbers come into play. Little pop up punch down to Mark Ellis to retire the side. So nothing comes to the error by Coco Chris. We play two and a half, but still two nothing red.
A reminder to join us for MLB tonight right after the game. A live day of baseball between the A's and Reds. So many of you will be seeing Steven Strasburg pitch against the Royals. And after all, the live baseball is through. A complete recap of a 15-game schedule on this Wednesday. MLB tonight right after the game right here on MLB Network. Back for the bottom half of the third, the Reds on top of the A's, 2-0. Back with Sean Casey, Matt Vaskersian, and Johnny Cueto back to work against Adam Rosales, who takes a strike. Rosales, Ellis, and Davis for Oakland. First six A's to come to the plate have all been retired. Six up, six down for the Reds' right-hander to start the day. Nice little breaking ball taken for a strike, 0-2. That's what Johnny Cueto does so well when he's on. You see that first pitch sinker right off the plate in the corner, strike one, outside corner. Then he comes to that little slider cutter, 88, outside corner. Those are two tough pitches for Rosales to really jump on. Now he's got a mo two. Tried to nibble there with a fastball. The ball and two strikes. We mentioned how Johnny Cueto was tagged with the nickname uh, Mini Pedro when he came up as a young red. From the Dominican Republic and in fact was the first product of the Reds Dominican Academy. So many teams have satellite offices in the Dominican now if you will. Academies where they can teach and sign. Yeah. Really that's a signing tool more than anything well, else. There's so much talent down there in the Dominican. These kids come out of the womb with a baseball bat and swinging and then an arm throwing. They, they want to play baseball when they're a young age and that's what they do. So. These academies really help those kids, you know, uh, have an opportunity to make it to the States. Popped into center field for Drew Stubbs and one gone. Seven in a row retired by Cueto to start the day. So with one gone now, that'll bring up Mark Ellis. Now you watch Johnny Cueto and you think, what does this guy do so well? Why, why, are, why are good pitchers really good? Well, He's throwing first pitch strikes to five of the seven hitters. And they say the best pitch in baseball is strike one. And there it is again. Six of eight batters. But there it is again. 94 miles an hour. That ball is sinking on the outside part of the half, half of the plate. Or as a hitter, you give up on it. And he brings it back to the outside corner to get him 0-1. 0-2 now to Mark Ellis. And now he can work. When he gets 0-1... As a hitter, you start getting a little defensive, and, the, and that pitcher can then start making some pitches that he wants to make. And right there, you see another one right there, 91 mile an hour, kind of a cut fastball outside part of the plate, gets him 2 and he, now he puts Mark Ellis in defensive mode. Johnny Quinto making his first ever start against the Oakland A's this afternoon. So certainly you tell me, Sean, as a hitter, when you faced a guy as a, a first-time adversary, was it more difficult for you or for that pitcher? I, I think it's more difficult for the hitter because I think as a hitter when you start seeing the pitchers more and more you start seeing their stuff uh, then you start to get a beat on them but when you face a team and they're only going to play the Reds one time this year so you face Johnny Cueto once today all right you might leave the game and say now I know he throws 94 95 with a nice little slider and a good change up and next time I face him I'm going to get him but you don't have that next time so I think the advantage goes to a pitcher in this situation. The next 0-2 to Ellis. Hit in the air down the line in shallow right. <coughs> and it drops in front of Jay Bruce. Ellis running hard out of the box is into second with a bloop double. The A's have their first base runner on their first knock of the afternoon. Nice hustle right there by Mark Ellis. But I think just like uh, Jay Bruce, uh, Coco Chris before, Jay Bruce right here feels like he should have had this ball. You got obviously Votto and Phillips converging on it, but you know, he just really misses that baseball. He knows it right there too. <laughs> Not a bad pitch again. Another slider outside part of the plate. Ellis just kind of lets it travel, bloops it to right field, and uh, is able to hustle it out of the box and get a double on it. So a runner in scoring position for Oakland now for the number nine hitter Rajay Davis. Davis wears one. Hey, when you're in the midst of an offer like Rajay Davis is, you're right. going to get on base any way you oh, can. I'll take it right there. I mean, I'll, I'll wear one to get on base because sometimes when you get on base, you feel like, oh, this is what it feels like to be out here. 
I'd like to be out here more often. Maybe a couple knocks would help out. <laughs> this never feels good, though, right there when you, oh, wear one right in the ribs. You don't want to rub it either. Just, you're just telling yourself right here, just, oh, don't rub it, don't rub it. And then the, you get the first base, and Joey Votto says, hey, man, you all right? How you feeling? Oh, yeah, fine. Everything's good. Yeah, that one hurt. Those hurt. How much for one of them ribs? Let me punch you in the ribs real quick, Matty. I'm good. That's what it feels like. I'm good. <laughs> Here's Coco Crisp now. Trying to compensate, make back, if you will, for the error in the previous half inning. That, by the way, did not end up costing the A's. Yeah. Big relief for Coco. You can see that dugout. As long as it didn't cost him an error, I mean, cost him a run, that errors, hey, well, all forgiven. We mentioned it earlier. Chris reinstated off the 15-day DL yesterday and went one for four. He's appeared in now four games this year. Not what he or the A's envisioned when he joined the green and gold over the offseason. Changeup's been a tough one so far on it. One and two. You know, Cueto right there throws that first pitch fastball. Coco takes a big swing at it. What does he do second pitch? He comes back with a little changeup, get him off the fastball, and then another changeup, 1-1. One, one. Triple up on it here. I wouldn't be surprised. Instead of fastball fouled away. away. We mentioned Chris back in the lineup yesterday and against Bronson Arroyo. His first home run is an A. It's always a great feeling. So you're on the DL for, for you know for a few weeks here. Come back. You want to make a contribution to home or your first game back. Always first game. Another changeup right there. So we went fastball, changeup, changeup. Another fastball away. Tries to get him to chase a changeup right there. Two balls and two strikes. If you're at the plate right here, you're Coco Crisp. Are you just trying to react, or are you going to guess a little I'm bit? I'm staying on the fastball right here. Man, he think he was too. <laughs> nasty but that's the nasty change up right there you saw the you saw the one two kind of fade away well this one right here it has the same look at that fastball rotation right down the middle and then has that almost uh, sinker action at the end that's a tough pitch to hit as a hitter because it looks like a fastball for 56 feet and then it leaves you did you know his change was that good yeah he has got a great change up he's got a great change up. that's 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 one of his uh bread and butter pitches yeah, that was hoffman-esque yeah Derek Barton now with two gone. There's runners at first and second. You're starting to see him throw that changeup now. Uh, when you, when you, now these guys are coming around the second time, seeing them through. You're starting to see that changeup come out a little bit more, trying to get them off that fastball. Zero and one. The count to Derek Barton. Playing in his 74th game of the season here this afternoon. And that total leads the American League. He had to pull his hands in. He's jammed and he pops it to short. Tough Cabrera side. Cabrera fight in the sun, but is there to make the catch. With the glasses on, might I add. <laughs> A strand a pair. We're through three. It's still 2 nothing Reds.
Jay Bruce leads things off in the Cincinnati fourth. It was his bases loaded two run single that put the two on the board for the Reds in the very first inning this afternoon. Back with Sean Casey, Matt Vaskersian. Nice to have you with us from Oakland. Ben Mazzaro back to work. He has Bruce, Nix, and Stubbs in the Reds fourth. Two balls and no strikes to Jay Bruce. One of a number of former first round picks, not only on the roster, but in the lineup this afternoon for Cincinnati. There's that sweet swing again as he dumps a single in front of Gabe Gross. So make Jay Bruce two for two today. Nice piece of hitting. At first at bat, uh, Mazzaro gets him, gets him 0-2. He gets that fastball down. And this time he gets him 2-0. Comes with a little curveball, sinker. And then he goes fastball in again. The same, almost the same spot Jay Bruce got that first hit on. Fastball inside where Jay Bruce likes it. Gets his, gets his hands right inside the ball. Lines it to right. That's a nice looking swing right there. If, in fact, uh, Ben Mazzaro has a third chance to pitch to Jay Bruce. Right? Yep. He's going to try. I think he's going to try to keep the fastball away. Something away? <laughs> yeah. Here's Lance Nix now with Bruce aboard. Nix swings at the first pitch and sends a fly ball out to center for Crisp. And there's one gone. But we talk about all these these former first rounders on the Reds, Sean, and between uh, Drew Stubbs, Jay uh, Bruce, six. Scott Rowland, a first rounder back Stubbs. in his day. I know we're talking about a veteran guy now, but so much amateur talent and a lot of it coming together in the same class you know Stubbs and Bruce are only a year removed from making their debuts Roland of course getting the day off today with a day off, with a day off tomorrow a team day off which is I think Dusty Baker is looking to do that with Scotty Roland get him get him a day off when give him a blow when you have a day off for the team so he gets two days rest so the point being here the the Reds are in a pretty good position moving forward with a pretty good nucleus of players and, and getting the kind of pitching performances out of some of their young starters. Speaking of number one guys, talent like Mike Leake, yep. Aroldis Chapman in AAA. Yep, Homer Bailey who got hurt, another another number one guy. Yep. I mean, they, they, they've done a good job of, of drafting and, and obviously having Walt Jockley too. He's going to continue to do a good job of drafting good players developing guys uh, I think uh, since Bob Castellini's taken over this team uh, in the ownership part hired Dusty Baker they've really done a great job of implementing hey listen this is the way we want to get back to doing doing it right we want to draft some good draft picks up top and then developing them in our system soft liner to Rosales got it over to first real hot but Bruce was back in time well <laughs> look at him looking at look at Bruce looking at Rosales say what are you nuts I wasn't even that far off the base. <laughs> Bruce gets out there, but I tell you what, this is one of those ones maybe you want to put in your pocket, too. If Rosales throws that away, Bruce keeps running. This is one you just want to eat. <laughs> you know who was real pleased the play was made? Billy Hatcher. Oh, yeah. First base coaches. <laughs> he gets doinked on that one. Yeah. Hatcher's looking to take cover right there. Here's Ramon Hernandez now with two gone. I don't know that a lot of fans in Oakland in the ballpark today or, or even watching on TV remember the number that Billy Hatcher pulled on the Oakland A's in the 1990 World Series. Wasn't he 8 for 8? At one point. At one point. He finished 14 for 27 and set a World Series record for batting average in a series that went four games. Red swept the A's. A's were heavy favorites that year. Dave Stewart was terrific all season. Reds knocked him around. They did the same to Bob Welch. And that guy, that pesky guy, was <laughs> right in the middle of it. He could hit, man. Hats could hit. But that 8 for 8 was a pretty impressive stretch he had there in the World Series. One another Ramon Hernandez and the sliders taken for a strike. And you remember Chris Sabo, you know, talking about how they, you know, they shocked the world and they, you know, no one thought they could do it. And they won four straight. That was pretty impressive, though. That was a pretty impressive Oakland A's team that they beat, went in there and beat. No doubt. Top of the order next for Cincinnati. And when you think about going eight for eight in that particular World Series, you would have had to have at least one, if not two, plate appearances against Dennis Eckersley. 
Bob Welch, Dave Stewart, Mike Moore. You know, everybody talked about the Bash brothers in those A's dynasty teams. Pitching staffs they, were unbelievable. They were there because they were pitching. That, that, that's what makes it even more impressive that every night he was facing somebody that had some pretty good stuff. So, that may, yeah, you're right, Matty. That makes it even more impressive what he did that World Series. Two and two now to Ramon Hernandez. Reds get their runs in the top of the first inning. 1989 World Series title came against the Cross Bay rival San Francisco Giants, and then, of course, the run of three straight in the early 70s. First of which coming against the Reds. Two balls and two strikes to count to Hernandez. Hey, got him again. That's a second hit batsman by Vin Mazzaro today. Trying to come in there 2 2, and just the sinker just got away from him. Didn't look like he really finished that sinker, and it, and it caught Ramon Hernandez. This is where he got into trouble last time. Got two two outs, then he walked a guy, hit hit a guy, and then Bruce got that hit in the first inning. So this is a this is a part right here where, where Vin Mazzaro really needs to learn as a big league pitcher. How do I shut an inning, inning down? When I start getting some trouble, I get first and second here. How do I make a pitch right here to get myself out of this inning? Orlando Cabrera has been a strikeout victim twice, and he'll pick on the first pitch conveniently and fly into center field to retire the side. So the Reds strand a pair. For many of you, we're sending you to Matt Yaloff at our MLB Network studios, who's going to get you ready for Steven Strasburg against the Royals. For the rest of you, we'll be back here in Oakland in just a bit. Still a 2-0 lead for the Reds as we post the national television schedule for the weekend. Padres raised. That's noon, East, noon Eastern Thursday. Series finale from St. Pete. Tigers and Mets that night from City Field live here on MLB Network. The following day, we'll bring you the opener between the Tigers and Braves from Turner Field in Atlanta. Saturday on MLB Network, you get the Phillies and Blue Jays. That's technically a home game for the Jays being played in Philadelphia. Because of the G20 Summit, of course, they changed the location of that series. Connor Jackson leading off against Johnny Cueto in the home fourth. And he's got a base hit to open the inning for Oakland. You know, Billy Bean going to get Connor Jackson. This guy, it, he can swing the bat. And uh, maybe this change of scenery, getting out of Arizona, getting into Oakland, maybe this will rejuvenate his bat and get it going again. Right. Nice piece of hitting, though. Gives ball, balls inside, pulls his hands in right here. Nice leg kick up, timing. Hits a nice line drive to left. I think change of scenery is really a, a key sentiment for Connor Jackson as Kurt Suzuki digs in now. I mean, talk about a guy that 
really didn't like the surroundings. Valley fever costing him almost the entire 2009 campaign as a Diamondback. So back in the Bay Area, familiar with this part of the world is Jackson because of his college days at Cal Berkeley. And perhaps you're right. Maybe he can turn the page and enjoy that Bay Area air. Sometimes that all that's all it is is getting to a place where you feel like, all right, I feel wanted here or whatever it is, confidence wise. And, and uh, you know, for Connor Jackson, I think it's like, especially when you get traded to a team, you think, all right, these guys want me. They're putting me in the three hole every night. And that sometimes gets your confidence going, gets you back to the player that everyone thought you'd be. One ball and one strike to Kurt Suzuki. Rounded to third in his first at bat behind now one and two. You know, Kurt Suzuki, when he first came into the league, he didn't know what he was going to be. He looked a little awkward behind the plate, swung the bat all right. Well, now you're starting to see him. He's made some great plays behind the plate. He, he handles the staff really well. And he can swing the bat a little bit. He's got some, that ball jumps off his bat, and he can swing the bat a little bit. He's turned into a pretty good big league catcher. As the A's trying to get some of his numbers out there for the, the mainstream media consumption regarding his all-star candidacy. This is an important one. The A's pitching staff has an ERA of about 3.5 with, with him behind the plate. And that's the lowest catcher's ERA in the American League. That number means something. That number means something. And the guy back there calling the pitches, that means everything to those guys. And, and obviously, the way he handles the staff and the way he goes about calling the game. So, like I said, when you when you think of the better catchers in the game, you don't necessarily ever talk about Kurt Suzuki, but this guy is a is, is a pretty good big league catcher. He he gets the job done back there and he can swing the bat. First full count issued by Johnny Cueto and it leads to his first base on ball. So Oakland has their best opportunity to score right in front of them here in the fourth. Runners at first and second with nobody Nine. out. And Kevin Third Kuzman baseman. off the batter. Kevin Kuzman out. Wouldn't be surprised here to see Cueto try and pound something in on Kuzman off or get him to chase something to roll over on because he's a good double play candidate, double play ball candidate right here with no outs. Kuzminov lays off the first offering. The guy they call Kuz is batting nearly 400 in interleague play. 20 for 51 against the senior circuit. And that's lined into left. We'll see if they wave Jackson around. They're going to throw up the stop sign at third. Mike Gallego taking no chances. And the A's have loaded the bases against Johnny Cueto in the fourth. Kevin Kuzminov continues to swing a hot bat. He gets that pitch inside. Not much, not much sink on it. Kind of stays up. Kuzminov right makes him pay. It's a really sharp line drive to the left. And I think Mike Gallego does the right job right there of holding up Connor Jackson because Connor Jackson doesn't run that well. And, uh, and Kuzminov really hit that ball well. A golden opportunity now for Oakland. Gabe Gross, the batter, left handed hitter, a strikeout victim in his first plate opportunity today. First ball swing and he pops it up. And Hernandez has no play. Not even in Oakland is there a play on that ball. That is one of the worst feelings as a hitter. You get that first pitch fastball, bases loaded. You're licking your chops when you're on deck in that situation. And then you pop it up. And Gabe Gross was trying to get that ball foul as quick as he could. Now he has new life, 0-1. Jeez, nothing worse than fouling out with the bases loaded, no outs. See Gross's numbers overall, 12 runs batted in. Seven of those have come in bases loaded situations like this one. He's two of seven with the sacks full this year. A ball and a strike to him now. Well, this is really laid out nicely for Bob Guerin as Gabe Gross makes a start at the number six spot in the order today. And Gross is a, a platoon player. He'll DH, he'll play the outfield, a situational guy, left-handed batter. Numbers have always been much bigger against right-handed pitching like Cueto. One and two and one now, rather. Cueto doubling up in the changeup there. Came first pitch fastball. Now he doubles up with the changeup. Be interesting to see if he 
if he'll throw it three times in a row. I, I think if you're Gabe Gross, you've got to look for that fastball right here. Fouled away. Two balls and two strikes. Adam Rosales next for Oakland. It's the first time that the A's have really made quite a work today. Just to hit through his first three. Two hits have come here in the fourth inning. Swing and a little one hopper to second. Phillips will come home. They get the out at the plate. We'll turn it into a double play. Wow. That's a great play right there. Brandon Phillips probably could have caught that on the fly. Let's it bounce. Obviously, it's not infield fly because because it's not in the air, not not a pop up in the air. That's what I think. That's what Bob Guerin's saying. Hey, it's an infield fly because you saw Brandon Phillips right there not catch it. it. It's it's almost like a low line drive. What a smart play by Brandon Phillips. Gets the out at home, rings up the, and, and gets a guy at third. Jerry Crawford saying, Hey, that ball's not a pop up. It's not a, it's not in the air. Infield well, you, fly, Bobby, Bob Guerin saying it's an infield fly. Yeah, you make you make the point uh, well. That that's exactly what Bob Guerin's trying to argue. Jerry Crawford's not going to put up with too much oh. of this, so he's <laughs> <skipper's hot. laughs> Jerry Crawford, get, you know, better umpire, he gets fired up too. It's escalating. Start the clock. Start the clock, America. He's about 20 seconds from being run. He's saying the Bob Guerin saying the ball's in the air. It's an infield fly ball, but the, the, that ball was. That ball could have got down. He <laughs> gone. <laughs> he had to. He had to do it at that point, oh, right? Jerry, yeah, he, he, Jerry Crown is not going to not stand but for that I, all day I long. Mean, Bob Guerin had to make sure at that point that he got thrown out. Oh, hey, Bob Guerin's got to get thrown out right there. He comes out to make the point. Doesn't hear what he wants to hear. But see here, so he might have a point. But the ball is a sinking. It's a sinking line drive. He's not camped under the ball. You know, he's not coming in to get that ball. That ball is a sinking line drive. I don't know that any of the umpires called for the infield fly rule. Usually, that is a tough ball. You know, off the bat, you'll see the signal that the infield fly rule is in effect. And yeah. I, again, we didn't get a good look at, at the. Uh, well, this might tell us if somebody was putting that hand up in the air. No, no, no one not was. at any point. In fact, clearly, you saw Jerry Crawford say, "No catch." No infield fly rule signal was given. You could you could really make the point where that ball was it was really a dead ball. I mean that ball was not hit that well and it, it, it was dying when it got to Phillips. Obviously I think Phillips could have caught that ball, but it wasn't it wasn't so noticeable that you would call the infield fly rule after the ball left the bat. Smart play by either way it's done. Smart play by Brandon Phillips. If it wasn't info, it should have been an info fly, and he gets away with it, or if he just made the smart play. But letting that ball drop, he gets the guy to the plate. Obviously, Suzuki's going to hang up and wait for him to catch it, but Bob Guerin's got to get tossed right there. He did the right thing. He he still believes that it was an info fly, and Jerry Crawford no, was, you know, obviously only going to put up with so much, but that's, that's the right call. Rosales. Here it is if you missed it, America. That's it. You're gone. <laughs> That's it. I've had it. You know, Bob Guerin, when he was a Yankee, played for Billy Martin. And I, I'm not sure if he if he absorbed any of those argument skills or not. Here's Adam Rosales now. And there are runners at first and second that remain after the double play. Man, that, the A's have bases loaded and nobody out. Ty Waller, by the way, is going to be the acting manager now. The bench coach will take over. He's got the lineup card in his hand. Man, they were sitting pretty about two minutes ago. Now you got the manager ejected, two outs, first and second. <laughs> you know what? That also does too. That gives the pitcher, that gives Johnny Quaid a little bit more life too. Saying, "Okay, we got a break right there. We got two outs. I got to try and slam the door here and get out of this unarmed, unharmed." When you're going bad, it goes bad. It's kind of stuff that happens, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. There's a 1-1 home to Rosales, and it's two balls and a strike. Mark Ellis waiting next for Oakland. The A's trying not to let this one-time bases loaded, nobody out opportunity go by the wayside.
Adam Rosales not with great numbers in situations like this one just four for 22 with runners in scoring position and two gone. Big breaking ball stays off the corner and it's full three and two. The Royals and Nationals are underway. Keep you posted as to scores from Washington, D.C. Steven Strasburg on the mound for Washington today. That's the other early game in the league this afternoon, and Rosales is caught looking at a slider. Base is loaded, nobody out, and the A's are turned away with nothing, thanks in part to this controversial double play. Still 2 0 red. Vin Mazzaro back to work, still trailing the Reds 2 0. A golden opportunity for some runs on his behalf. Gets away from Oakland in the previous half inning. The A's had the bases loaded with nobody out. Yet Johnny Cueto got out of the jam. So Miguel Cairo will open the visitors' fifth. The 2 3 4 batters for Dusty Baker, Cairo, Votto, and Phillips. You know, after that. After that first inning where he gave up a couple runs, Vin Mazzaro has really, really settled in here. And we're talking about he's in the top of the fifth inning, really settled in and has been pitching well these last few innings. Three balls and a strike. You know, it would be a small victory for, for Vin Mazzaro just to get past the middle innings. And you're not talking about a kid that's made a lot of career starts. As Cairo strokes a 2 2 pitch into center field. He's gone more than six innings in just two of his 21 career starting assignments. So some company there at first base for Billy Hatcher. And I want to make sure I get the numbers right, Case, because there's some blogger somewhere who's about to crush me. <laughs> Shocker. Uh, the World Series numbers were 9 of 12. The postseason that year, 14 of 27. No. 9 of 12 World Series, 14 of 27. In the league championship, championship series and World Series. Any way you look at it, they're good numbers. Yeah. <laughs> Any way you slice it, dice does it great. Make sure I dot my I's and cross my T's here <laughs> today. Joey Votto has walked, scored, and reached on an error this afternoon. Up next for the Reds, and we we glanced on this a little earlier. Home for the Indians. For Oakland, they start a decidedly softer portion of their schedule after the Reds leave town. They've got the Pirates coming in. 
And for the A's, it's a likely opportunity for them to get it back together after what's been a very difficult month of June. Only two clubs in the big leagues have fewer wins this month than Oakland. Interleague play not been good to the A's. When you're scuffling, you need sometimes you got to get the team like the Pirates to come in and get yourselves back on track, go out, beat the teams you're supposed to beat. And uh, for Oakland, they need to have somebody to come in here to feel like you know, we can get at least a series from this team and get back on track. In fact, only the Pirates and the Baltimore Orioles have put together fewer victories this month than the A's. Those are the next two opponents for Oakland. Big swing and a miss by Votto. So one gone from a zero here in the fifth. Nice pitch right there. Just a little, little fastball up. Votto couldn't Number catch four, up to Brandon Phillips. Mazzaro striking out Votto. Suddenly I feel like having a cannoli. <laughs> Here's Brandon Phillips now with the man aboard. Oh, Mazzaro's up to 78 pitches. We'd like to see if he's going to go deeper in this game. He's going to have to minimize his pitches here in the next couple innings. That's a start. That'll minimize it. Kuzminov to Ellis, back to Barton, the double play. What a pretty turn by Mark Ellis. So underrated at second base for Oakland. The double play makes for a quick inning on behalf of Vin Mazzaro. Middle of the afternoon. Reds still lead the A's 2-0 Cincinnati. Well, Mark Ellis turned the nifty double play to get Vin Mazzaro out of any difficulty in the previous half inning. And Mark Ellis will lead off the bottom of the fifth for Oakland. Ellis, Davis, and Crisp for the A's. 2 nothing Reds. Those two first inning runs holding up for Johnny Cueto so far this afternoon. Mark Ellis doubled in the third, his first hit of the series. And the longest tenured current A lays off to make it 2-1. and one. You know, hard to believe, Sean. Mark Ellis has never been an all-star, nor has he ever been a gold glove winner. That is hard to believe. He is he's just been solid at everything he does since he's been with Oakland. Pops this one into foul territory for Votto. And there's one gone. Hey, this Saturday night, interleague action with a twist. Toronto gets home field advantage in Philly. No way is that going to go over well by the Philly fans, <laughs> by the way. It's going to be Cole Hamels and Sean Markham. Saturday night baseball is presented by Chrysler. Right. Phillies and Blue Jays, some are going to see the Tigers and Braves. It all starts Saturday live at 4 Eastern, 1 Pacific, right here on MLB Network.
Here's Rajay Davis with one gone. Another first pitch strike for Cueto. Out of that outside corner. Oh, oh. Davis, you'll recall, was hit by a pitch in his previous plate appearance back in the third. I played with Rajay Davis in 2006 in Pittsburgh, and he was kind of bouncing up and down. And, uh, you know, he was one of those guys. What a, a great guy, great teammate, but just never really got a chance with the Pirates to play. Comes out here to Oakland, kind of keeps grinding in the minor leagues, does well, gets up here, makes the most of his opportunity last year with all the stolen bases he had. He, he's had now he's in the lineup and he's been pretty much an impact player for the Oakland since then. On a couple of hops out the second for Phillips and not even the speed of Rajay Davis is going to get him on base there two gone. Yeah Rajay Davis is just the second a in the last 16 years. To have at least 20 right. stolen bases before the all star break. Number four. Pretty impressive. Whenever you put your, your name on a Ricky Henderson list, you're, you're doing all right. You know you're fast. <laughs> <laughs> he had more stolen bases in the first half than I did my career. How many did you end up with? <laughs> like 17. It's not bad. Hey. 17 it's more than good. most of us have. It's not good. But <laughs> <laughs> it's Coco Crisp, and on the first ball, a line shot past Cairo into left. Oh, that's got to feel a little bit better. It's been kind of a hang with them afternoon so far for Coco Crisp. You know, Coco Crisp has been hunting that first pitch fastball. Yeah, it's been a tough day for him at the plate. Caught looking in the first, and he clanks a fly ball later on. That came in the third. Had another plate appearance in the third. Struck out. So maybe he's turned the corner here. Second half of the ball game. A base hit with two gone in the fifth. And sometimes it takes that one positive thing to happen to get you, get you going a little bit. He got a fastball up there from Cueto. Did a nice single, a nice hard single to the left. Here's Derek Barton now with that base runner aboard. <laughs> Back in 2008, when we got that big bench clear with Coco Crisp and, and, and uh, James Shields. Remember that with Tampa? Yeah, yeah. Boston, we went out there. I kind of get into it a little bit with James Shields and you know everything like that. And Coco felt like uh, you know I had his back. So a couple of weeks later, uh, he 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 gives me a present in this big box. He got me a John Cena fat head blow up that you put on your wall. You know, <laughs> you know the you know, the things you stick on your wall. It's fat head things. He gave me like he ordered it for me. He goes, hey man, thanks for having my back. I'm like, oh man, thanks a lot. You're thinking maybe he's gonna give me like 50 bucks or something. He ends up giving me a John Cena fat head thing to put on my wall. I was like, Coco, man, thanks for that. That's awesome. <laughs> That's outstanding. Did you ever patch that up with James Shields, by the way? Oh yeah, I saw him the next day in the uh, in the weight room. I said, hey, no 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 hard feelings, right? Got there was no hard feelings. It's just one of those things when you get in that bench clear. It's just it's craziness. You gotta let us all know that you, you work out in the weight room. Huh? Yeah. Oh yes, yeah, you know, yeah. When I was up there doing my curls and my bench presses, <laughs> ball and two strikes. The count home to Derek Barton with Chris for board. Ace had an opportunity in the fourth with the bases loaded, and nobody out, and were turned away. Trying to manufacture something here with Derek Barton. You know, when Coco Chris went out there to get Shields, though, and Shields threw that one punch, and, and Coco, I don't know if you remember the replay, Coco, I mean, it was an unbelievable dodge. It looked like he was a legit boxer. It turns out he was a gold glove boxer growing up. Oh, for real? Yeah, and I was like, how'd you miss, how did he not crush you on that pitch? He goes, well, on that punch, and I said, well, he was a gold glove boxer. I said, dude, if I look at you, I, you, you look like a 150-pound soaking wet with a bag of nickels in your pocket. I take you on. <laughs> but I think if you took him on, he'd probably slap you around. Great guy, one of the nicest, most unassuming guys. And Barton takes ball four. Boy, that's a perfect Billy Bean played appearance. Derek Barton was the guy that the A's went out and got and uh, cited a refined batting eye, an on base percentage type player. And he put that into practice right there with a fine appearance against Johnny Cueto. So runners at first and second out for Connor Jackson. You remember that deal as we take a look at Jackson's numbers for the year and it was it was really criticized quite a bit in the Bay Area because the A's sent Mark Mulder to the Cardinals when Mulder was in the in his prime. I mean he was a part of that big three rotation. And Billy Bean acquired Derek Barton 
Kiko Calero and Dan Heron. Looks like looks like Billy Bean knew what he was doing, and you know, unfortunately, Mulder started to break down after that too. He had a couple good years there in St. Louis and started to break down. But those, all those guys made big impacts for, uh, and Derek Barton, you know, still is making an impact. Danny Heron and, uh, and Kiko Calero. That's a, that was a good trade for Billy Bean. He has a knack for making those kind of trades. Two balls and no strikes. It counts Connor Jackson. I'm sure if pressed, though, Billy Bean would admit to a couple that missed. And that's that's just the nature of it. Listen, he, his batting average is terrific, but not all of them have worked out great. What, what was the deal for, in fact, up? I'll look it up right now. When they dealt uh, Tim Hudson to the Braves, I don't think that one worked out as well as the Mulder trade. Yeah, that Mulder trade. I mean, they got three legit big league players back for back for Mulder. The conversation on the mound. Two balls and no strikes. The A's with another opportunity here in the last of the fifth. Tim Hudson to the Braves in exchange for Dan Meyer, Juan Cruz, and Charles Thomas, an outfielder that did not end up sticking. Yeah, that trade didn't work out. No. But you got to, you know, you got to take your chances and, and trust your scouts that they that they're giving you the right info on these guys will turn out to be good big league ball players. Well, here's the thing: for for both the Reds and the A's, maybe more so for for Oakland currently because they're so strapped in a ballpark that they they can't make the kind of revenue that even the Reds can in a new facility. They have to roll the dice more often. You've got to roll the dice. They, they've got to take chances. They've got to, you know, rule five draft, waiver wire. They don't have the deep pockets that teams that play in new ballparks do. And that's that's just another opportunity. I don't want to get too high up on my soapbox here, Case, but <laughs> Doc Connor, this club, need, they need a new ballpark. Uh oh Connor Jackson with a swing and a drive into left. This is going to die for Lance Nix to retire the side, saving me any awkward political statements, <laughs> or at least putting them off to the next inning. Hazel May has all the great plays you missed the day before every morning on MLB Network's Quick Pitch. Catch all the highlights plus recaps from every game all in one lightning fast hour. Quick Pitch presented by Burger King all morning, every morning on MLB Network. Johnny Gomes leads off the Reds half of the sixth and on the first pitch from Vin Mazzaro straightens out a breaking ball in the left field. Leadoff hitter is aboard for the third straight inning for Cincinnati. Well, there was news today in baseball, Sean, when we woke up and uh, we opened up our uh, laptops and our PDAs and our Blackberries and all the other things that we get our information on. And 
We learned that the Marlins had fired Freddie Gonzalez along with uh, hitting coach Jim Presley and coach Carlos Tosca. So a couple of organization guys are going to come up and uh, serve as coaches. An interim manager has been put in place and it's less about the interim manager than it is in my eyes at least the guy that was let go. I thought Freddie Gonzalez handled that potential fiasco with Hanley Ramirez very well but I, I think that may have ended up contributing into his demise. I think it did too as we see Jay Bruce here get another get another fastball uh, pitch inside and, and hit a line drive to right. But yeah you know for me looking at, at, at Freddie he, I thought he did a great job the last few years at the Marlins and that whole thing with Hanley Ramirez I thought he handled it right. If you go back and look at it, Hanley Ramirez walks no, after no, the ball down the left field line. Freddie gets into a competition with him, sits him a couple days. But that's what, that's what makes you wonder. You know, Jeffrey Loria makes the statement of really saying that we're, we're going to move in a different direction and fire Freddie Gonzalez. But the real question is, what was going on in the clubhouse? And what was what was his relationship with Hanley moving forward? Did he did he lose did he lose uh, the club? That kind of thing. I think those are the real questions. What kind of uh, Backlash was it going to have moving into a new stadium here soon? Uh, I think those are the real questions. But Freddie Gonzalez, I feel like, did a great job over there in Florida. Edwin Rodriguez, AAA skipper at New Orleans, is going to be the interim manager of the Marlins as they take on the Orioles later on tonight. Yeah, hard one to figure. I mean, uh, the Marlins are the same club that fired Joe Girardi as reigning manager of the year. Then he goes to the Yankees and a yeah. season and a half later, he's a World Series winner. Well, Freddie Gonzalez is going to land on his feet. This guy is a good manager. He knows what he's doing. First ball swing into Lance. Next grounds it to Rosales, to Ellis. And for the second straight inning, the A's have turned to double play. Two gone in the sixth. Really, just what Mazzaro was looking for. Got a ball out over the plate after meeting from the mound. Gets a little sinker outside. Lance Nix just gets in front of it a little bit, chops one to short. Easy six or three. How good does Kurt Young feel right after he goes out for his visit? Oh. Was it the next pitch or two yeah, pitches next later? Pitch. Bang, double play ball. Oh, that's when you feel great about yourself. That you're giving your pitching coach the ultimate compliment there, huh? Yeah, heck yeah. Hey, you know, what, what he told me to do, I did. But it also goes the other way. If you come out there, you give a piece of advice, and the next pitch is a three run homer, too. It goes the other way. Up. Boy. <laughs> I should have said something different. Drew Stubbs with one man on now. And a ball and a strike to Stubbs. Kurt Young had a nice career with the Oakland A's. In fact, I, I contend that in 1987, when he was 9 and 4 at the break, he had a chance to start for the American League All Star team that year. And in 87, the game was played right here in this ballpark. And it would have been such a terrific story. What happened? Snub. Oh, got snub? There's always an all-star snub, yeah, right? That was that was the one that you remember. Huh? I, I don't let go of stuff like that. <laughs> two balls and two strikes to count to Drew Stubbs. It was right before the A's were good. It was Dave Stewart's first of four straight 20-win years. Fly ball down to the opposite field for Gabe Gross. Two runners aboard to start the inning. But Vin Mazzaro turns in a zero in the sixth.
The stars align for the 2010 Major League Baseball All-Star Game as the American League's best take on the best from the senior circuit. Don't miss the action Tuesday, July 13th, 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific on Fox. Just up the, just down the road, rather, in Anaheim, California. The All-Star Game coming up in less than a month. Hard to believe. Kurt Suzuki leads things off in the Oakland half of the sixth inning. Suzuki, Kuzman off and Gross. Suzuki picks on the first pitch and sends a drive to center, playable for Drew Stubbs. You know, speaking of the All-Star game, just thinking back to, you know, talking about Kurt Young getting snubbed. And that first, the first All-Star game I ever went to, he was 25 years old. Uh, went to the one in Fenway Park in 99. Number Ted five. Williams came out. And that was a special. Looking back now, I think I appreciate it more now than when I was so young and just I was kind of in awe of the whole situation. But when Ted Williams came out of that right, of, of right field there and really came in with, to throw out that first pitch when McGuire walked up to him with Tony Gwynn, it was just such a neat time for baseball. That whole game, the atmosphere at Fenway, what Pedro did those first few innings. Looking back at all-star games, if there was one I could put my finger on, that was one of the most special of them. Here's Kevin Kuzman off now with one out. Did you, as a uh, as an all-star that year, but as a guy that you weren't in the home run derby? No. Were you there? Did you watch the home run oh, derby from the Was field? I there? I was seven feet away from McGuire. I, th I thought I won a contest or something. I didn't think I was like a, a really an all-star. I thought I won a contest. I had my video camera ten feet from McGuire. I have it all on tape. I'll have to bring the show you the tape, Mag. I got it all on tape of hitting, hitting balls like 9,000 feet. Sharp one hopper to shortstop for Cabrera. Well, you were an All-Star in 99, and you were an All-Star in 2004, and it was on this date, 2004, Sean Casey goes yard twice at Shea Stadium against the New York Mets. Sorry about it, John Franco. Lefty-lefty matchup. Doesn't bother my man here, pal. <laughs> and Tom Brenneman was going crazy in the booth that day, Pally. I'll tell you what, man. That was, that was one of my best games ever right there when I went five for six with that homer off Johnny Franco. That was my 100th career homer, too. I had 30 more in the next, like, five years. Did you know that today was the anniversary of that? No. Our Pretty guy, impressive. Chris, Thanks, guys. Producer Chris Pfeiffer. That's a feel-good moment for me. I appreciate that it. one for you. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a lot of fun playing. You went, anytime you went to New York, whether it was at Shea or, or Yankee Stadium, it was always fun to play there. But uh, it's always fun, too, when you have big games there, too. Gabe Gross with two gone and the base is empty. Johnny Quetta with a couple of quick outs here in the sixth inning. And looking for his first one, two, three inning since the second. Here's that foul ground. Oh, 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 oh my. Sni sniper. Miguel Cairo just hit the trip wire and went down as he was about to make the catch. That's just one of those things here. What happens? He just slipped. He just slipped on the grass right here. His, his left foot slips back. He gets under it. And uh, that's just one of those things that you, hopefully they, you, know, you laugh about it after the game. You know what happened there? I know exactly what happened there. The grounds crew at Oakland is outstanding, but that's one of the divots that Jamarcus Russell left on one of his many sacks for a loss. <laughs> that might be, but right here, watch his left foot. Just slips right here. Slips out from under him. Throws him back. It's tough to even analyze that play because he basically just slipped. <laughs> and, and there's, no, and there, there's nothing to talk about, really. You're trying to help him out a little yeah. bit, but he just <laughs> lost his footing. And Gross shoots this one into center field. Doesn't matter. No harm. Did they hang an error on him? I think they've got to. They got to hang an error on him, yeah. Sort it out when we come back. Send the bill to Jamarcus Russell. 2 nothing Reds.
Thursday night baseball is driven by Chevy, and tomorrow night we'll be live at City Field in Flushing for the Tigers and the Mets. Hisanori Takahashi hosts for New York, and Armando Galarraga, Mr. Near Perfect on the mound for the Tigers. Thursday night baseball driven by Chevy. Coverage starts at 7 Eastern, 4 Pacific. Plus, join us early for a live installment of MLB tonight from City Field. That's tomorrow right here on MLB Network. You know, Matty, you got to give Vin Mazzaro some credit here. I mean, after that, he hit through 24 pitches that first inning, got into a little trouble. Jay Bruce got that single to right to score two runs. Since then, in the second inning, through 11 pitches, through 20 in the third. The last three innings, he's thrown 13, 11, and nine pitches. Been really efficient with strike one and coming back and filling up the strike zone and get, getting some double play balls and some guys to pop up. He's done a great job since he settled in after that first. And for a guy that has not been past the fifth and sixth inning very often in his young career, this uh, represents a great leap for him starting the seventh inning. Down only two. Those two early runs still holding for the Reds. Ramon Hernandez chops the ball up the middle. Ellis to his right. And has plenty of time, one away. Mazzaro's career long outing came last year, seven and a third against Baltimore. So an opportunity for him to approach that number here today. One gun now for the top of the order, Orlando Cabrera. You curious as to what uh, Steven Strasburg's doing today? Yeah, I am. Case? I want to see how many punch outs he has. That's through three. The Royals and the Washington Nationals are scoreless, and Strasburg has struck out four. He's also allowed four hits. Again, 0 0. Royals, Nationals. We'll have complete coverage, of course, of Steven Strasburg's day in D.C., along with the rest of the schedule on MLB tonight. Coming up later on, right here on MLB Network. You know, the way we talk about Steven Strasburg, it's almost like each opponent is just a nameless, faceless, uh, you know, robot. Because we're, we're really, wow, look Whoa. at Mark Ellis make the adjustment wow. there. See the English in the ball. Cabrera caught that off the end, little cue ball. Mark Ellis, but it's a great play right there. He's in front of him. Look at that ball. Take that hop. Nice play by Mark Ellis right there to make that. Make that. He made that look a lot easier than it was. Oh, yeah. And when you catch that ball, it's got English on it too, so your hand needs to stop that spin. A tough play. So two away now. Here's Miguel Cairo. We've seen differing uh, degrees of defense here today, for sure. Coco Crest dropping a fly ball. Miguel Cairo slipping in foul territory. We've also seen some very good plays today. You know, back to Mark Ellis' case, we talked about this. He's not committed an error this year. His career fielding percentage is 989. That's the third best career fielding percentage by any second baseman who's made at least 750 or more games. The only two guys with better numbers are Ryan Sandberg and Placido Polanco, which might come as a surprise to some. He's awfully good as well. Vin Mazzaro is just a third of an inning away from matching a career Vin innings Vin high, but still 2 nothing Reds.
Well, the Reds continue to lead 2-0, and it was the two runs in the first, courtesy of Jay Bruce, and his bases loaded two-out, two-run single that posted the runs. It stayed scoreless since. Oakland had a huge opportunity to score. Bases loaded, nobody out in the fourth, but Mark Ellis hit into a double play that was contested by Bob Guerin, his contesting that the infield fly rule should have been effects. No, sir, said umpire Jerry Crawford. Threw him out of the ball game. So Ty Waller has had the manager's card the rest of the way. And leading off the home seventh, Adam Rosales is grounded to shortstop. So 2 0 Cincinnati. He even runs as fast as he can off the field. He's out. Number 14. Mark it's a little disconcerting. Right? I wonder if that dude ever enjoys himself and takes his time. I think there's an ad campaign there, you know, showing like. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if he's married with children, but if he's a father, maybe, you know, feeding his kid real quick. Or, or him eating dinner. What happens when he gets the steak, <laughs> potatoes, and the rice in front of him with the side of veggies? How do we put the clock on him? Does he eat it as quick as he runs around the bases after a homer? Can he put a T-bone steak away in 28 seconds? <laughs> A ball and a strike is the counts of Mark Ellis. Just four hits for the Oakland A's this afternoon. Only one of them good for extra bases. That was Ellis's one out double back in the third. The only starter in the Oakland lineup this afternoon who has any postseason experience in this uniform. That was against the 2006. When I was with the Tigers, we played, we, uh, played them in the ALCS. Bounce back up the middle and through. Mark Ellis has his second knock of the ball game. Hey, a reminder to visit the official online shop of Major League Baseball today. Browse the largest selection of official gear for the whole family. Get your gear from the official source, the official MLB.com shop. Accept no substitutes. Here's Rajay Davis now with a man on and one away. Davis was hit by a pitch and has grounded a second today. Fly ball in the central. Bruce Stubbs is there. A lot of aggressive approaches today, Sean. A lot of first ball swinging. I really has not I was just thinking that same thing. And, you know, as a pitcher, you start feeding off that aggressive nature. That pitch right there uh, looks like a, a pitch that Roger Davis, Davis can handle. But right when he goes to swing, he has a little sink on it, runs in on his hands. And that's where Plato gets you to pop up. But he's had a lot of quality first pitch strikes all day today. So with two gone now, it's back to the top of the order. Coco Crisp, who singled in the fifth. He first pitch swings a lot, too. Or bunts. And takes a strike. There's what I'm talking about, Matty. Quality first pitch strikes. That's not a four-seamer right down the middle. That's a little little, little two-seamer right, right on the outside corner at the knees. That's how he gets to 0-1. He's been getting 0-1 there all day long. Should Chris have success? Derek Barton's next. Trying to bunt for a hit. Puts it in a good spot. But a very good play by Ramon Hernandez is able to get him by a step. Not a bad idea. Instead, the A's are turned away in the seventh. Still 2 0 red.
This copyrighted telecast is presented by authority of the Office of the Commissioner of Baseball and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form. And the accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without express written consent. Back with Sean Casey, Matt Vasturgeon, top half of the eighth inning. The Reds continue to lead 2-0 Cincinnati. And Oakland has gone to the bullpen. So Vin Mazzaro gone after seven very strong innings today. He just missed matching his career long, which was seven and a third, posted last June. As Mazzaro has yielded to one of Oakland's two left-handers out of the bullpen, Jerry Blevins taking over here in the eighth. Well, Mazzaro really puts a great game today. After that, like we talked about before, after that first inning, he really settled in, was throwing quality pitches in quality spots around the plate. Getting guys that swing at his pitch. Uh, great job by Vin Mazzaro tonight, today, for throwing seven strong innings. Three balls and no strikes as you count to Joey Votto leading off the eighth. The Reds would uh, certainly not say no to some insurance. Votto, Phillips, and Gomes here in the eighth inning. And a strike to make it three and one. For Jerry Blevins, this was his first appearance on the opening day roster this season. You relief stints with the big league club the last couple of years. Came to the A's in July of 07 in a mid year deal with the Chicago Cubs. It was the one that sent Jason Kendall to Chicago. Blevins came to the A's along with catcher Rob Bowen. Been a while for Blevins since he's last been out there as he misses with a breaking ball and walks Joey Votto. Talking about six days between outings. He last pitched in Chicago back on the 17th. Yeah. Well, that's a lot for a reliever. Sometimes when your team's not winning, you don't get into the situation you're supposed to get into. As a reliever, you're looking to get slotted in when you're the setup guy or even if you're the long guy or you're the, or you're the seventh inning guy. When you're losing and you're down runs, it messes up the whole the whole uh, rotation of guys out of the pen. Well, it was a, a one-hit wonder, if you will, as Brad Ziegler is going to take over for Blevins in the eighth. Another change. We'll be right back. Well, Ty Waller filling in the acting manager after Bob Guerin was run from the ball game has made changes for back to back plate appearances here. He wanted Blevins for the left hander Votto and Votto drew a base on balls and now it's Brad Ziegler the right hander for Phillips and Gomes. And the submariner comes from down under for a strike and it's nothing in one home to Brandon Phillips. Well, Brad Ziegler, that uh, Oakland right-hander who A's fans certainly recall 
entered with a splash in June, July, and August of 2008. 39 consecutive scoreless innings to begin his career, resetting a new American League record. More concerned about the present than he is the past, trying to mitigate this mild threat. Leadoff runner aboard in the eighth and trying to keep it a 2 nothing deficit for Oakland. You know, as a hitter, when you face a guy like Craig Ziegler, you really got to just pick up the ball. You can't focus on his delivery. Obviously, submarine guy, but you really you can't you can't focus so much on that he's down there. You got to just pick up the loose point, trying to pick up the ball early, and hit the baseball. You know, sometimes you can get caught up in guys' uh, delivery too much, and that messes you up. So as a hitter, you just need to slow it down, make sure you're picking up the ball out of his hand, and not get so worried about how he's delivering the baseball. You'll hear managers talk about the way they use guys who come from underneath, like Brad Ziegler, very diplomatically, depending on which side of the plate's due up. And Ziegler's splits fall right in line with uh, how you'd expect, although he gets not touched up, but allows a base runner here on a float single by Brandon Phillips. So runners at first and second. Right handers have not had a lot of success. Against Brad Ziegler. Yeah. Well, you know what? That was a case right there, too, with Joey Votto at first base. Uh, Brad Ziegler delivers the ball here, and Brandon Phillips blues one to right. This is a situation, though, knowing your outfielders. Coco Crisp does not like to throw. He doesn't have a great arm. He doesn't like to throw. Now, he can go get it in the outfield. He can cover those gaps, but he doesn't like throwing the baseball. So Brandon Phillips gets a ball here, backs up. He just kind of stays through it, bloops it into right field. But Joey Votto does a great job of knowing that, hey, Coco Chris is not going to throw me out of third. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a chance here, get first to third with nobody out. Here's Johnny Gomes now, and he rips the first pitch into the corner. Well hit. That's got a chance, and it's off the wall in left. Votto coming in to score. RBI number 50 for Johnny Gomes. This guy has been as flat out been an RBI machine. We talked about it before him coming over here from Tampa. Really not getting much much playing time the last couple years there. But watch what Johnny Gomes does so well. He's always looking to pull the baseball and do some damage. Right there, he gets a ball inside from Ziegler that, that kind of uh, doesn't really sink down. It kind of stays flat. And Johnny Gomes just pulls his hands inside the ball, looking to hit something hard first pitch and hammers one off the wall. But boy. What a big surprise he's been for that offense, and, and a big surprise. I know they were thinking he'd be the guy off the bench, a guy that maybe platoon a little bit with Lance Nix, but you know what? Johnny Gomes has turned into a, a guy you can't take out of the lineup. How do you take him out of the lineup when he's getting big hits for you every night, driving in runs, and winning ball games? Like I was talking, like I said before earlier in the show, they love him as a teammate. He's a team guy, comes to play hard every day, sets a tone in the, in the clubhouse. Great pickup for the Reds. So now Oakland intentionally walking Jay Bruce, and this was certainly not what Ty Waller had envisioned when he made the move. Levin started the inning, he walked Votto, and then Ziegler comes on, allows the single to Phillips, the RBI double to Gomes. Craig Breslow's up in the bullpen, and you'd think, Sean, this would be the spot for him because Lance Nix is next, a left handed batter, and here comes Ty Waller for the second time this inning. I think that's the right move. Go get the lefty right here. Conjuring up the spirit of former A's manager Tony La Russa. Get the guys in the bullpen up. I'll be right back. Look up Breslow. He went to like Yale. Yeah. He was with us in San Diego. Yeah, I played with him a little bit in spring training. He's like a literal rocket.
Well, a couple of changes here as the managerial wheels are turning with the bases loaded and the Reds up 3 nothing in the eighth. First, a new pitcher. He is left-hander Craig Breslow taking over with nobody out and the sacks full. Play with Craig Breslow in, in Boston spring training. This guy has a degree in molecular biophysics and biochemistry from Yale. So when I would talk to him in the clubhouse, I would think, we don't have a common with this guy. <laughs> the only thing we have in common is that little white ball. <laughs> I have no idea what he's talking about. He specializes in stem cell research. <laughs> Would you specialize in Richmond? Speech communications, that's odd. <laughs> <laughs> when I got this job, my dad said, hey, finally you're using your degree, son. Jeez. <laughs> that money didn't go to waste. Ball and two strikes is a count from Greg Breslow to the pinch hitter Chris Heisey. Heisey's been terrific off the bench for Dusty Baker this year. Three pinch hit home runs. That gives him a share of the major league lead in that category. They like Chris Heisey. Adam Sia College. Fifth round pick a couple years ago. And at spring training when I, when I went down there to work with some of the players he was a big league camp and they just kept talking they talked about Pedro Alvarez and Francisco and some of the young guys. Chris Heisey, the guy that kept saying, wait for Heisey. Watch this kid hit. Watch this, how he goes about his business. He can run. He can he can feel, but he can hit. He breaks his bat here and fouls it off. It's still the ball and two strikes. Well, Oakland can ill afford any more Cincinnati offense here. Run in. Bases are loaded in the eighth. It's quite a fix for Craig Breslow and likely the rest of that bullpen to be emptied out here too. This is a spot here if you're Craig Breslow. You'd love to get a strikeout right here. One, two, get a strikeout and maybe get the double play ball, get out of this inning. After the pinch hitter Heisey, it's back to the right-handed batter Stubbs and Hernandez. Still nobody out here once again. Again, Ty Waller, the acting A's manager, making the move to uh, not only a situational matchup here that was countered by Dusty Baker, but one of his hotter pitchers out of the bullpen. Let's see what happens here if they send him. Fly ball for Gabe Gross. They're not going to test the former Auburn signal caller. Everybody stays put. Yeah, you got to stay put right there with uh, you know, Gabe Gross. Obviously, has a good arm. Shallow fly ball. Heisey just missed getting that job done. Didn't get it out there far, far enough. Now number six. Especially with a full head of steam like that, huh? Yeah. The perfect position to throw. by 45 feet. That's when guys get hurt. No chance. Phillips even not Brandon, going anywhere. Even Brandon Phillips, who, run, who runs well, is not making that. So here's Drew Stubbs now. Two of six with the bases loaded this year. He has a grand slam to his credit this season. Really been swinging the bat well these last few weeks. Start off real slow. He was sitting around 180, 180, 190 for a lot of the beginning of the year. Then Drew Stubbs has really started swinging the bat better the last few weeks. Stubbs behind 0 and 2 now. Craig Breslow last worked in the series opener on Monday night and went a scoreless inning with a strikeout. It really has been good of late. Opponents are one of their last 28 against them. That's over nine plus games. Maybe one of 29. Stubbs pops it up for Derek Barton. You know, this is one of those kind of below the radar appearances, Sean. And for a guy like Craig Breslow, who's been around, if if Oakland free falls from here on out, and it's something that certainly Bob Guerin and the uh, Green and Gold guys would like to avoid, Craig Breslow could turn into a piece, a chip, in a smaller deal for the A's to perhaps get something back for something down the road. I totally agree. Craig Breslow would be great for a team down the stretch. Lefty specialist out of the pen, throws strikes. Uh, I think you know he could be a great addition for for a team that really needs that lefty. Um, for the last few months of the season. 
drafted by the Brewers is a 26th rounder out of Yale in 2002 and made his major league debut in San Diego some years later he's since been property of the Red Sox the Indians the Twins and for the last couple of seasons the Oakland A's one ball and one strike to Ramon Hernandez and you could talk biochemistry with them there's not too many people you could talk biochemistry or biophysics with Maddie do you know any you really wanted to risk sounding like an idiot right <laughs> I wouldn't even come close to that I'd be exposed in 10 seconds <laughs> Me sound, too. I sound like an idiot idiot doing this job <laughs> <laughs> one ball and one strike the thing for Oakland and, and not to not to harp on this but you know how, how many years do you oh we're rebuilding we're rebuilding we're, we're trading guys you know you don't let your fans fall in love with anybody you don't make a commitment to anybody long term they tried it with a couple of guys here the last few years and you know Eric Chavez was the guy in that great class of Tejada and Giambi and Mulder Hudson Zito Chavez was the guy they made the long term commitment to and unfortunately nagging injuries just prevented him from ever being the player that, that they thought he was going to turn into. How about Craig Breslow? What a great job by Breslow. Base is loaded and nobody out, and Breslow gets off the hook. 3 0 Reds. Well, you figure in a 3 nothing game, there'd be plenty of pitching and defense, but not all the defense has been clean. A couple of drop pop-ups, a stumble in foul territory. A lot of it's been real good. Mark Ellis making an adjustment here in the later goings. Even the fans have gotten involved. <laughs> that was a great play by the fan right there. All right, so as we're set for the bottom of the eighth, one change defensively for the Reds is um, Heisey stays in the ball game. And takes over in left field. Here's Chris taking over out there in the left for Lance Nix, for whom he pinch hit. And opening up the bottom of the eighth inning for Oakland is Derek Barton, who singles on the first pitch he sees. So the A's have their leadoff hitter aboard against Johnny Cueto. This is the time of the game where you start, you, 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 the starter's still in there, you're seeing them three, four times around the lineup. Now you start to have really have your game plan down. You, see, you can see Barton there. Obviously, he was hunting that fast fastball first pitch. Got it. It's a nice line drive to right. Five hits for Oakland this afternoon. Only one of them good for extra bases. Here's Connor Jackson. He has one of the singles today. Oakland's had really two legit opportunities to put a run on the board. They had runners at first and second in the third. They were turned away. And then a golden opportunity in the fourth. Bases loaded, nobody out. And that's when the double play led to Bob Guerin's claim that the infield fly rule should have been in effect in his subsequent ejection. 
He's got nothing in that threat as well. Jackson grounds it through the hole on the left side. That's going to bring the tying run to the plate here in the last of the eighth. And it's probably going to get the bullpen going out there, too. Here comes Dusty Baker, and uh, he's either got the hook in his pocket or he wants a little more time. I would imagine they're hot. You got Nick Massett up and Arthur Rhodes, and they're going to go with the big right-hander. Two right-handed batters due up for Oakland, and the Reds have gone to the bullpen for the first time today. Cueto done after seven-plus leading three-zip. We'll be right back. Well, Oakland has uh, another opportunity to get on the scoreboard at home this afternoon. Cincinnati thinking sweep with big right-hander Nick Massett, who inherits a couple of base runners and nobody out in the last of the eighth. Kurt Suzuki, the batter for Oakland, one of the A's better producers with runners in scoring position. He swings at the first pitch and chops it to third base. A fantastic play by Miguel Cairo. And the Reds turn it into a double play. Wow, what a great play by Kyra right there. Nick Massett comes in, makes, gets that first pitch sinker down in Suzuki, chops it, chops it down the line. Cairo uh, shading that line a little bit. What a nice play to, to get that double play ball. But just like that, Nick Massett throws one pitch, gets his 5-3 ground ball. And now he's just one out away from cooling this thing off altogether. Gabe Gross, the batter. I'm sorry, Kevin Kuzminoff, the hitter for Spore Oakland. And he's got a single on his line this afternoon. Gross stepping into the on-deck circle. Nick Massett, this has really been Dusty's, one of Dusty's go-to guys. Him and Arthur Rhodes getting to Coco Cordero. He has a 6-4-6 ERA, but I think that's from a few, uh, one one really bad outing he had this season. But this guy's got great stuff. He's got a really a nice curveball right there, heavy sinker, good split finger. He's got great stuff. But Dusty Baker, he ranks among the National League leaders in appearances. And there's a reason for that because Dusty Baker knows that in this type of situation, stuff usually plays out to get to your closer. And Nick Massett is the guy with, with some pretty nasty stuff. Massett was originally drafted by the Rangers as an eighth rounder back in 2000 as Kuzminov swings over the top. He was sent to, to Chicago to the White Sox along with John Danks in December of 2003. 
White Sox sent him to Cincinnati in the Ken Griffey Jr. deal in 2008. Martin single to open the inning. Connor Jackson followed with a single. Dusty Baker made the move to the bullpen for Massett. He threw one pitch and got the ground ball on the double play. And he has just struck out Kevin Kuzminov. Fine work from Nick Massett out of the Cincinnati bullpen. We're heading to the ninth. It's still 3 nothing Reds. Well, Johnny Cueto had the bullpen hold up behind him. Nick Massett kept his line clean. Cueto was outstanding this afternoon. Seven scoreless innings. He scattered seven hits, punched out four. And Johnny Cueto leaves in line for the victory here this afternoon. It would be his seventh of the year. I think a big part of Johnny Cueto's day today was of the 30 batters he faced, he threw 21 first pitch strikes. And when you're living like that all day long, where you're consistently up on batters 0-1, 0-2, you're going to have some success. I think we saw that from Johnny today was getting up on guys and putting guys away. The A's have made another pitching change on in relief of Craig Breslow. The fifth Oakland pitcher to work today is right hander Michael Wirtz. You wouldn't think in a, a three nothing game that one side would have burned through four relievers but that's what's happened with the A's today. Wirtz back out there after taking the loss on Monday. He was charged with his first loss of the season that night put together quite a winning streak career high seven game winning streak hot shot for Kuzminov who knocks it down and gets Cabrera for out number one just a reminder later on tonight on MLB Network MLB tonight brings you up to speed with everything happening in Major League Baseball on this Wednesday Getaway day for much of the league. The other Bay Area team, the San Francisco Giants in Houston tonight. Barry Zito, the former A against Brett, Brett Myers, who might possibly be making one of his final starts in an Astro uniform if what we're reading is true and everybody's on the block down there in the Space City. That would be a nice pickup for somebody to get Brett Myers. Never you never have enough start pitching. You know, there's teams down the stretch that would love to have him in their rotation. We'll also have all the latest on Steven Strasburg's start at home against the Kansas City Royals happening as we speak. Chopper for Rosales backed up on it and allowed Miguel Cairo to reach base safely. I think that's almost that's that do or die play right there. Rosales has to take a chance on what he did was he chopped his feet to try to get that long hop. But when you got a guy like Cairo running, running you got to charge it as, as quick as you can. 
I think he waited back on it a little too long, and that, obviously that last second. Right here, you can see this stutter step right here. He's got to just keep coming. See that stutter step right there? He's got to just keep coming through the one-hand grab and try and get rid of it. So Cairo's aboard with one gone now. Scored a base hit for Miguel Cairo, his second of the game, and Joey Votto can bat with a man aboard. And by the way, just to keep everybody current on uh, Steven Strasburg, 1-0 Royals at the end of five. Strasburg has struck out seven. He's being outpitched by Brian Bannister today. There's another biochemist who's seen that Brian made that a biochemist, but Brian Bannister is always going into the science of pitching and trying to figure things out, just like we're talking about Craig Breslow. Craig Breslow was terrific today. One of the highlights for Oakland, along with Ben Mazzaro, threw the ball very well today as the starter. But ran into a tough Johnny Cueto today. Strike to Votto, two and one. Joey Votto has walked twice and scored a couple of runs this afternoon. Again, the Reds headed home after today's. They get themselves ready for the Buckeye State battle with the Indians that starts on Friday. Three balls and a strike to Joey Votto. And there's ball four. So Cairo reaches on an infield single and a play that should have been made. And then Wirtz loses Votto. Now Brandon Phillips with two runners aboard. Interesting pitch right. selection right there. 3 1 count. He's got a man on first base. And he, and he uh, drops that 3 1 curveball on Votto. I think right there, maybe he'd try and, try and come right at him, maybe get that sinker, maybe get a, try and get a ground ball right there. Brandon Phillips, as you saw, a couple of hits and a run scored today. Well, the Reds can sit back and do a little scoreboard watching tonight, Case, and uh, Dusty Baker will know by the time this one's over that he can watch the Cardinals and Blue Jays. That's a great matchup tonight. Ricky Romero and Chris Carpenter. And the Reds might have a shot at getting back into first place in the division. Yeah, and you know what? Dusty Baker's really done a great job. He does a great job of uh, of being a good communicator with those players, being down in spring training with them this this, uh, this off this um, spring training, and having a chance to sit into the early meetings before they get the day going. They have all the coaches in the room, and Bake goes through. Hey, listen, this is what we're doing. A couple guys you know, run the pitchers and the hitters and everything, but Bake runs the show down there, and, and he's done a really a good job in Cincinnati. He's really been a great find uh, for Bob Castellini and. And Walt Jockney over there. The players love him as a communicator. The ball bounced away from Kurt Suzuki, so Miguel Cairo advances to third. Votto moves up on the, or stays at first base rather, on the back end. Runners at the corners here. Yeah, Dusty Baker's actually in the last year of his deal. The last of a three year contract with the Reds. He's one of a number of veteran high profile managers playing in the last year of a contract. I don't I don't visualize any of them going anywhere Joe Torrey they talk about maybe him shutting it down in LA I, I think he's gonna stay uh, as long as he wants as Ellis flips it to Rosales the relay back to Barton is in time for the double play nothing further for the Reds and it looks like it's Frankie Cordero to try and shut it down as we go to the bottom of the ninth.
Well, the Reds are three outs away from finishing up a victory and a road sweep in Oakland. And Francisco Cordero is on to try to work this bottom of the ninth and get the Reds on the road, splitting a tough West Coast trip. Cordero here in the ninth will get Gabe Gross leading things off. It'll be Gross, Rosales, and Ellis representing the last chance for Oakland here today. Gabe Gross hitless. In fact, he and Rosales on deck, both taking an offer on this day in Oakland. One and one from Cordero. But Francisco Cordero has really been terrific this year, Sean. And as you mentioned, along with Arthur Rhodes and Nick Massett, who we saw today, it's a beefed up back of that Cincinnati bullpen. That back end of the pen. That you, to, be a, to be a team that contends year in and year out, you really have to have uh, uh, three guys towards the end that can shut it down. And you got Arthur Rhodes, who's obviously having an unbelievable season so far. And uh, Nick Massett has the has that great stuff. And and Coco Cordero has really done a great job closing games out for the Reds. Well, Cordero pitched yesterday and earned save number 18 in Cincinnati's 4-2 victory in Oakland. Did give up a couple of base hits. And Gross pops it up. One away. Cabrera does a great job right there. That, that sun in Oakland this time of the day is really tough. And what he does right there is you see how he shields his body, no, has his glasses on, up. shields the sun by the way with his glove. And is able to make that play, but you know, it looks so routine. It looks so routine, but right here, you, you know, sometimes you the ball's in the sun and you lose it, and you just kind of hold that glove there, waiting for the ball to come out of the sun, so you get a beat on it. It's a nice play. Here's Adam Rosales now with one away. I can't let this opportunity go by the wayside to say it one more time. You can see that shot, and it, they have to close the top tank in open, right? They don't sell tickets up there. Only the ones right behind the plate. This ballpark used to be a gorgeous place to watch baseball. And the Raiders moved back from Oakland. They filled in center field with that monstrosity out there that they call Mount Davis in honor of the Raiders owner. And it completely took away the view of the Oakland Hills and made it much more a football stadium than a baseball park. And it's too bad because as the, the Raiders have benefited from the luxury suites that they can sell, it's really hurt the Oakland A's. When you go play there too, Matty, it just feels like a football stadium. It kind of feels like you're playing baseball in a football stadium. But I think eventually, hopefully, here, the Oakland A's will get a chance to get a new stadium. Swing and a miss, and the A's are down to their last try against Cincinnati this afternoon as Cordero punches out Rosales. So Mark Ellis, Ellis has the last chance for Oakland. Number 14, Mark Ellis. Both teams idle tomorrow. Oakland stays home to welcome the Pittsburgh Pirates. The Reds traveling back to Cincinnati after the game. They'll be off at home tomorrow and Friday. They welcome the Cleveland Indians for the first of three over the weekend. 0-2 oh to Mark Ellis. Coco Guerrero is not wasting any time. He's just coming in, filling up that strike zone. Saying, hit me if you can. I think as a closer, when you come in with that two, three run lead, it's a lot different than when you have that one run lead and you have to nibble a little bit. You come in with a three run lead, nobody on, uh, two outs here. If you if you groove one and he hits a home run, so be it. Still got, it's still three to one. So you can take some chances in the strike zone and make some quality pitches. Ball and two strikes. Matt Yaloff, Dan Plezak, Mitch Williams, and Ken Rosenthal are teed up back at our MLB Network studios. And uh, MLB tonight will start as soon as we're done with the A's and the Reds. And it looks like that moment is near. That's going to do it in Oakland. The Cincinnati Reds began this road trip by being swept in Seattle. They respond by traveling south and sweeping the Oakland A's. So the Reds heading back home with a 3-3 three and three trip. And a chance to end the day, depending on what happens with the uh, Cardinals and the Blue Jays. 
back in first place in the National League Central. Well, they're back on the winning streak here with three in a row. Johnny Cueto, really the story today, came out through uh, seven strong innings. Uh, great baseball, just filling up the strike zone, and the big blow was really Jay Bruce in that first inning when they got bases loaded, and Bruce got that fastball down and in to get those two runs in. Johnny Cueto congratulating his mates after the victorious performance in Oakland this afternoon. Cueto gets the win and improves to 7-2 as the Reds have defeated the A's 3-0.